Okay, good morning. Welcome to Math 261 Delta College. This is Vector Calculus. It's Tuesday, October 19. This is our class session. And this week, we are finishing our current chapter. And that is everything we can do with derivatives. And one of the most famous things we can do with derivatives are optimization problems, min max problems. What do optimization problems look like for functions of multiple variables? And then we'll open up the next chapter later on Thursday, which is beginning to turn to integration. What can we sum in space? So for optimization, let me get my paper set up right here. We kind of have two paths that we can follow. And one of them is to say, how could we effectively mimic what we did in function of one variable, a real valued function of a real variable? What are the critical points? Remember from your calculus, the first and second derivative test. What the first and second derivative test did was tell you how to dispose of a critical point. Could you tell whether the critical point was a minimum, maximum, or neither? And the first derivative helped you identify critical points, but the first and second derivative tests help you decide what kind of points they were. So I'll make you some sketches to remind you of that in a second. And that is completely successful. But we have another door open to us because of the multiple variables, because of the really excellent tool, the gradient. And that is the method of Lagrange multipliers. So you're frequently looking at problems where you want to maximize some quantity given some restriction or some quantity in some area or space or piece of space. So that's called maximization with constraints. And the gradient is a really, gives us a really effective way to set up those problems. And the person who worked this out or it was named in honor of is Lagrange, famous French mathematician. And we'll show you what a, a Lagrange multiplier is. Uh, we might introduce it today and dig into it more next time. The method of Lagrange multipliers is very efficient, but it comes with a heavier cost in solving systems of equations. Critical point first and second derivative test, we're gonna be successful with that. It's not the first derivative test so much that we'll imitate as the second derivative test, but even that requires breaking things into many cases. So I, th I think that's gonna be the theme in either one of these approaches. That when we're in space now, we have many different cases that we have to examine. Okay, so we're finishing up this chapter, then we're gonna move on to the next chapter. And after the end of the next chapter, you're gonna have an exam. Let me just orient you on our website so that you know you can look ahead and see what people are up to. So here we are, Matthew 61. We're in week eight. We're looking at, let's see how large this is on your screen. It's pretty large, but I can make it larger. We're finishing up chapter four with the optimization problems. And then we'll look at chapter five. We'll begin to use integration and multiple integration. And at the end of that, which is another two weeks, and we'll have a review period and second exam. Okay, so that's our pattern. Two chapters, review exam. Two chapters, review exam. And then the last chapter six, where you get to the whole summing up of all of calculus, which is one chapter, review and exam. You're paying attention to the homework you're gonna to submit tonight. Here we are in week eight. 
So you're submitting two problems from four, five, and four, six, and then a problem of optimization in the traditional sense from four, seven, and then with Lagrange multipliers and a beginning integration problem due next Tuesday. Uh, the problems that I've given you right now, I have had kind of some, I put in some extra parts to make you compare some of the things you're doing to give you some perspective on what you're doing. That's what my hope is that those problems are giving you, but it's a little bit of extra work. I acknowledge that. In our Mathematica worksheets, notebooks right here, I've got several examples of how to use the Lagrange multiplier and how to do optimization in the traditional sense, absolute minimum and maximum images. These are just some images you can look at and practice with inside of our Google Drive and Mathematica. So you can download those and use those notebooks to create some useful images. The Lagrange problems are mostly examples right here, but they're kind of interesting examples. Today, I'm going to mostly stay with drawing things for you on paper, although we might bring a Mathematica here or there to illustrate something. But even if the machine makes awesome images for you, let me stop sharing the notebook and go back to my paper. You want to be able to visualize things yourself. You want to visualize things in your mind and you want to be able to visualize them on paper because that's how you know that what you're typing into the machine and what you're getting back in response is what you want to produce. So you have to have a feeling for what you want to produce before you produce it. The, the machine doesn't get rid of that for you. So I want to do a little bit of drawing with you, even if Mathematica can make much cleaner pictures than you or I can. Okay, let's move on to our topic. Uh, I graded papers and sent you grade reports in your folder. I also sent you a note that I updated your grade reports so that I did not overweight your first exam. And you can check that email out and send me a question if you have a question about that. But so far you've done homework in one exam. So they're each equally weighted in your grade because in the end they're each worth 25%. And in the grade book after the first exam, I had set the default of the exam's gonna be 75% eventually, yes but that kind of skewed your grade kind of uh, unrealistically, whether you got a higher or lower score on the exam, it made your grade either artificially higher or artificially lower because we haven't done multiple exams. So as always, examine your grade report. And let me know if you have any questions. Feel free to ask questions. Oh, that is what I wanted to bring from my website. So I'm gonna go back to my website for a second because I mentioned that before I hit the record button earlier. So let me go back to website. Remember under our handouts, I have formula sheets for all the things that we're compiling, but I also have some archive files, some zip files right here, useful vector and curve practice problems. Uh, those were earlier in the course, you might've looked at those. But I also have some archives of sample exam problems, exam problems, multiple integral problems. We haven't yet got to the multiple integral problems, but I have a lot of good problems in here from former books, former exams, 
things that I like to use. So basically you download this folder just by right clicking on it or just by clicking on it. And then you will download the folder. I won't wait for the download right now. And then double click on the folder, the zip file that downloads and you can get a folder with a bunch of problems worked out with solutions. Don't neglect those problems. You know, look through those problems, read through those problems, practice doing some of those. That'll give you some good practice as well. Okay, I'm trying to get rid of this. Get rid of this, stop sharing. Let's go back to paper. Okay, let's talk about optimization. as we did in Calc 1 and see what we can imitate. So we have a curve. Oh, let me see if I can get some nice curve color over here. Unless I don't know always how colors show up in the recording. That doesn't show up too badly, kind of an orange right there. So this curve is just flying through two dimensional space, X, and y, this curve is y equals f of x. And we clearly have some high points and low points on this curve. And what we noticed in Calc 1 was that high and low points, if the curve was smooth, occurred at places where we had flatness, where the first derivative was equal to zero. Let's call that point C and D right here. So at those two places, you had F prime of C equals zero, F prime of D equals zero. It doesn't indicate min or max, but it indicates flatness. And flatness is somewhere we should look for mins and maxes. It certainly was a place where mins and maxes could occur. So the C and D were called critical points. places where the first derivative was equal to zero. Also sometimes places where the first derivative did not exist. But not all critical points produced mins or maxes because you've seen pictures like this. Where I could have a high point, a flat point, and a low point in a picture. And here I have three critical points, three flatnesses. And one of the flatnesses turns out to be a relative low point. One of the flatnesses turns out to be a relatively high point. But one of the flatnesses turns out to be kind of like a leveling off, a neither high nor low. Let's call this C and D again. At this point we can call E. So just being flat did not give you a min or a maximum. You had to check out how the first derivative changed. So in this first picture up here, you know, I should, I'll be careful with my colors. I just wanted that curve to be a different color. When I have point C and D, now C and D were both to the right hand side of zero, which is not relevant in this problem. But as I looked at C and D, I can tell min or max by looking at the sign of f prime. The sign, f prime is a slope and to the left of c, the slope is, was always positive in this first picture and negative between c and d slope and positive after d. And so when the slope is positive and flat then negative, that gives me an idea that I may have a maximum there. When the slope is negative, then flat, then positive, that gives me the idea that I may have a minimum there. But I use the word relative or local maximum or minimum because I don't know if I might have a higher maximum somewhere else down the line. At this point right here, which is E, what I have in the first derivative is 
negative slopes to the left of E, zero slope at E, and then negative slopes again to the right of E immediately. So I am decreasing, flat decreasing. That is not a min or a max. And you can give it your own special name if you like, but it's just not a relative extrema. It's not a minimum or a maximum. Okay, one more thing we have to remember is that on top of this, we could have had endpoints like A and B to our function. Our function could have been going on forever or it could have been abruptly cut off. And as I've drawn in this picture, where I abruptly cut off this function actually happens to be the highest and lowest points on these curves. So even though this curve has a maximum, a relative maximum at C, the absolute maximum occurs at the endpoint B. And even though this has a relative minimum at D, the absolute minimum occurs at the endpoint A. Likewise for here. Now the endpoints don't always have to be the winners, but you have to remember this idea between absolute, and relative, or some people use the word local. Minimums and maximums. So you collect a lot of points that qualify as local or relative minimums, and then you test them against each other to see who's actually the lowest. But in that group, you automatically have to include the endpoints, even if the endpoints aren't a place of flatness. Because one of the endpoints could turn out to be the absolute lowest or the absolute highest. So you have this concept of absolute, relative, local, minimums and maximums. So the keywords, critical points, absolute, relative, min, and max. And one more idea I want to bring to you, and that is the difference between location and value. The location of where the min or max occurs, that's on the horizontal axis in this case, the x-axis. And the value of the minimum or maximum is the height of that curve at that place. So I could say I have a relative max at x equals c, but the value is the value of the function at c. So make sure when you're doing a problem, when they say, do they say where? do the relative min and max occurs? Where do the extrema occur? Or what are the extremas? So location is where, and the actual value is the what. So make sure you're sensitive and you answer the question they ask, or maybe you just answer both, but make sure at least you answer the question that they ask. So you got an absolute minimum at x equals a in both pictures. And the value of that absolute minimum is f of a. OK, so these are the things that we're going to be sensitive to. <coughs> now, how successful are we going to be transferring this to space? Let's talk about a function of two variables first, at least. So I'm going to draw my favorite two variable surface. There's something with a couple of mounds, something that looks like a parachute or a blanket. And I want to see if I can, there's a different color, a little more visible here. So I'm going to go high, high, and tuck in front 
and back. There. Here's a generic surface in space. Let's call it Z equals F of X comma Y. Let's label these points. We'll use these axes, X axis, Y axis, Z axis. Include the word axis if you like. If I see on this surface, I feel that there's some high points and there may be some low points but I can be fooled just by looking at flatness. Certainly flatness is part of what's going on. At a high point, I may have tangent lines that make a flat plane. And those would be places where partial F partial X and partial F partial Y are both zero. So this is going to be our critical points. Any place where not just one derivative equals zero, but the two partials equal zero. Because if it's flat in those two directions, we know from the directional derivative, it's flat in every direction. But I can also have this case right here. Let's see what color I want to use to represent it. Where I could have flatness that turns out to be like a mountain pass, that pen is not too effective. That pen is not super duper effective. I've been in the drawer too long during the pandemic. Where on one cut, I may be climbing to the mountain pass and descending on the other side. And on another cut, the Y direction perhaps, I am descending to the mountain pass and then climbing up the next mountain from that side. I could have a saddle surface here. I could have an elliptic parabola, not an elliptic paraboloid, a hyperbolic paraboloid. And I could still have flatness at this place. I'm gonna discard these pens and work with better pens in a second. But that flatness might not be a min or a max. So my checklist. Do I have critical points? Yes, I do. And sometimes I'll use this notation for partial F, partial X, where you put function little X or little Y in the subscript. So I have critical points. I have places I can look at, but I'm going to have to beware. I'm going to have to look out for these false flat places that are like mountain passes where you're climbing between two peaks, where you're at a low place between two peaks, but you're at a high place over the mountain range. How am I gonna deal with that? How am I gonna identify that? The other thing I have to worry about, so let me just make a note of that. How are we gonna identify mountain passes. The other thing I have to worry about is in the previous pictures, the border or the edge, I mean, frankly, we just called them in points because they were two points at the end of the curve. If I had in points, I was obligated to check those independently of anything I ever checked inside in the interior of the function. Because the endpoints could be the absolute lowest or absolute highest points independently of whether they were flat or not. Now, likewise, I could have the same problem on this bubble. This edge has high and low points on it. I just drew a casual, gently sloping edge here too, right? But independent of anything else in this problem, maybe this edge contains the absolute lowest point of this function. Maybe it contains the absolute highest point of this function. In this picture, it doesn't look like it's the absolute highest point on this black edge, but it certainly could be the absolute lowest point somewhere on this edge, depending on my perspective. Maybe there's an absolute low point right there. But this, is a lot heavier burden 
to examine a whole curve or border than it is just to examine two points. So I have to find a way to examine not the endpoints this time, but examine the border. And that could break down in any number of ways. So these are the three things we have to do to succeed in bringing our calculus one knowledge to our space. We can do them very well, but remember critical points are where both partial derivatives are equal to zero. That requires a little work. Examining the border is gonna turn out in many cases to be the worst work or the most work because the border could be in multiple sections. Say I want you to maximize or minimize something over a square in the plane. Well, then you've got this surface projected up here and you've got four edges you have to examine. You have to examine the four edges independently and the edges themselves have endpoints. So it's like you're going to have to check through your dimensions. You look for flat places in the two dimensional bubble. You look for extrema on the one dimensional edges of the domain. And then you have to look individually at the zero dimensional, the point corners of the domain. So examining the border could be a significant amount of work. But first we're going to figure out how to identify these mountain passes, or I'm gonna tell you how to identify these mountain passes. So what we're gonna do is take one of these people into space and we're gonna choose the second derivative test. The second derivative test will often be able to tell us whether our flat places are mountain peaks or the bottoms of valleys. And they can even tell us if our flat places might be, might be mountain passes. Sometimes as in Calc 1, even that wasn't sufficient to tell you, but that with some visuals usually gets the job done. So I'll refer you legally to the second derivative test because the second derivative test is a mouthful. It's in section four, seven, and I'll write it down in the legal way. And then I'll tell you what it means in the logical way. So there's a very simple way to explain what these things are. And we're talking about derivative of two variables, a uh, function of two variables right here, because we're often interested in mountain peaks and mountain valleys. So I'm quoting from, I don't quote page numbers in the OpenStax book because everybody's consuming the OpenStax book in a different form, but this is in the OpenStax book here in 417 and it's in section four seven. So let me show you how to test critical points and then we'll do some example with everything included. So let's say you have some function, z equals f of x, y, and you have a nice smooth surface f of x, y has continuous first and second order derivatives. in a neighborhood
of a critical point. X naught and Y naught. So that means the first order derivative in the X direction at X naught Y naught is zero and the first order derivative in the Y direction of X naught Y naught is zero. Writing it in the compact notation. writing the compact notation because I got to write something a little more flowery in a second. And I don't want to spend time doing the flowery partial derivative language. Okay, so you have flatness. You have flatness at x naught y naught. Well, what you want to really decide is how is the surface bending? For example, at this high point in this drawing, any way I cut this surface, it's bending downwards. No matter what direction I cut in, it's bending downwards as if my hand was cupped downwards. Now this, this camera is particularly two-dimensional, but pretend you cupped your hand and you cupped it downwards. Then you'd have a flat place maybe here, and that flat place would be a maximum in calculus. One, you call that the second order of test. If you had concave down and flatness, you had a maximum. If you had concave up and flatness, you had a minimum. And we can use the word concave if we want to. We can say this mountain peak is concave downwards. And if we had a valley, although I didn't draw it on this surface, I could have a low point having concave upwards, but I'm really worried about these points like right here, where in one direction it bends down, it's concave down, in the other direction it bends up, it's concave up. How do I avoid that? So what I want at a high point, I want to be able to identify that the surface is bending uniformly at a high point or low point. But here, at this false max or min, well, it's not, a, it's a saddle point, people call it. It's a mountain pass. It's a valuable piece of information, but I don't have uniform bending of the surface. So here's how I measure how the surface is bending. So you define D, it's called the discriminant, to be the second order partial of f with respect to x at this point times the second order partial of f with respect to y at this point minus the mixed partial derivative fxy at this point, second order mixed partial. Now, under these conditions of continuous first and second order partial derivatives, actually the fxy and the fyx will be the same. So it doesn't matter the order I pick here, but I have to square that. So this is fxx times fyy minus fxy squared. This is called the discriminant. discriminant because it tells us what kind of situation we have. It discriminates between, discriminates between two or three different situations. So here's the second derivative test. If this D is a positive number, then I have uniform bending of the surface, either bending uniformly up or uniformly down. And I identify that by cutting the surface in the x or y direction, either one is sufficient, I'll choose the x direction here. And if it's concave downward in the x direction and it's uniformly bending, then it must be uniformly bending down. 
So if I have uniform bending and I have concave downwards, second order partial with respect to X, negative, then what do I have? Concave down, uniformly bending down, mountain top, mountain peak. So at this point, X not, Y not. Then X not, Y not is the location. I specify location of a relative maximum. And then I can turn that around. If I have uniform bending, discriminant positive, and the cut second order partial with respect to X or Y, I'll just write X as the book did, is positive, then I have uniform bending and cutting along one of the axes, I have concave upness. So that means I have a minimum there. My hand illustration is not perfect. I understand that. Then X not Y not is the location of a relative minimum. But what happens if the discriminant is negative? That means that the surface is not bending uniformly. It means I've got concave down in one direction, concave up in the other direction. Oh, it's probably easier to draw than using my hands. Then I've got a saddle. And it's hard to draw that potato chip. I can't draw that potato chip well. That's not a great drawing. But think of a Pringles potato chip, bending up in one direction, bending down in the other direction. As long as I don't have uniform bending, then I know I have a saddle point. So X not Y not is the location of a saddle point, which is good information as well. It's just not a min or max. Ah, but we gotta go through all the cases, positive, negative. There's a possibility that the discriminant could be zero. And this is what would happen in calculus one where the second derivative was zero to point. What you got there is so much flatness. The thing is so flat that the second derivative can't sniff out whether you're bending up or bending down. Can't even sniff out if you're bending uniformly. So this is like the worst case scenario. If it's too flat for the second derivative to notice, then the book says the test is inconclusive. We could say that X not Y not, the surface is too flat for the second derivative to make a call. And you did have this in calculus one. Excuse me. For example, if you had the famous function x to the fourth, which is kind of like a parabola, but super flat at the origin. Function, derivative, 4x cubed. But second derivative, 12x squared. 
And it's clear that x equals zero is a critical point. It's clear that x equals zero is a flatness. But the second derivative at zero is also zero. The second derivative can't tell you whether it's concave up or concave down because it's too flat. In that case, the first derivative came to the rescue. And you notice that you had negative slopes before zero and positive slopes after. So you could tell that that's a maximum, I'm sorry, a minimum, but the second derivative test failed. Now here, we're not gonna worry about that so much. We got some visuals to help us too, but let's work on the cases that we can identify clearly. But yes, if the second derivative test fails, we're gonna have to turn to something else to make our decision. We could look at how this thing bends on in any one direction and see if that is uniform. Okay, so let's pull up an example. And then if we're lucky, we can do some graphics afterwards, but let's just start with a basic example. The homework problem I gave you in this case is also gonna be a pretty basic homework because your work is gonna be examining the boundary. So this second derivative test looks like, you know, legalistic or imposing, but it's mostly logical and relatively easy to test. The work in any one of these problems is examining the boundary. Whereas in Calc 1, if you had a boundary, it was just shoot in a point, shoot in a point, compare it to all the other points. Let me tear up this paper so I'm ready to move it up. Let's write down an example and get started. And then we can take a break. I don't think we'll finish the whole problem here before we do this, but let's give it a shot. Uh, I'm looking for problems specifically in the book where they have boundaries. And I'm trying to decide, I think 344 is a fair one. And it might tend to be on the easy side too, but that's a good way to illustrate things here at the beginning. So let's say, find the location and values. So I want both of minimums, maximums, relative, and absolute. Let's just go for the whole taco here. of the function f of x comma y equals x y minus x minus three y on the triangular region with vertices of zero, 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 four, and five, zero. So let's visualize this. I don't know what the surface looks like yet, I could have the machine draw the surface for me, but I want to practice visualizing things myself. The surface, I can't just plug in points and easily visualize, but this triangular region that I'm examining the surface over, zero, 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 four, is the triangular region in the plane. These are the x, y points right here. 
zero four and five zero. So I want to look at the surface above this triangle. And now, and I want to be very careful. I have no idea what that surface is going to look like. I'm going to draw a possibility, not a possibility of surface, but a kind of a schematic drawing. I don't know what the surface looks like, but let's say it's like wavy, wavy, and then wavy like that. Well, that's not a super duper surface. <laughs> But I want you to think about it like this. Think of this as a piece of metal or a piece of uh, metal trim that you've cut out in your garage after you were trying to clean up or construct something. A shard of metal, a sharp shard of metal that may have tips, sharp tips, low points and high points. And it may have low points and high points inside that region. But you be aware of those tips, right? You be careful that you don't get cut on the edges or get cut by those sharp pointy tips. I don't know if this thing has sharp pointy tips. I'm just saying, I'm thinking that I wanna make sure I examine that. And then we'll look at it graphically when we come back. So let's take this to the next page and examine it. So this is, not an exact drawing. This is not an accurate representation because we don't know that yet. A schematic drawing, it represents what's happening. It doesn't represent exactly what we have. So what do we do? Step one is we're going to find the critical points. Inside this two-dimensional triangle, do we detect any flat places? Remember, x goes from 0 to 5, y goes from 0 to 4. I'm not attaching any particular scale to this. That's a little bit longer in the x direction than the y direction. We call this triangular region R, if you like. And I want to see if there are any critical points inside that triangle. Flatnesses on the boundary will have to be dealt with on the boundary. I can't really talk about flatnesses on the boundary because I don't have a way to examine the whole neighborhood of a point on the boundary. Some of it doesn't even exist on the surface. So let's take our first and second derivatives. So the partial derivative with respect to x, we have the function up here in front of us, is y minus one. Partial derivative with respect to x of x, y is y. Partial derivative of minus x with respect to x is minus one. Partial derivative of minus three y with respect to x is zero. And partial with respect to y is x minus three. So I want to know where those are simultaneously zero. And this was set up to be a nice introductory problem. The only way for both of these to be zero at the same time is if I am at the position three comma one. And three comma one should be inside this triangle. Now, what I regret is I don't think I've drawn this triangle to scale, marking five spaces on the x-axis, four spaces on the y-axis. As soon as I drew that, I knew that that wasn't gonna do. So why not correct that right now? Let's just visualize five actual marks and four actual marks in the x and y directions. So I have this point here at five, zero, 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 four, 
and then the slope of down four, right five. I might be worried if three one actually lands inside that triangle, but now I see the three one comfortably lands inside that triangle. So there is a flatness that I want to examine, but there's only one flatness. Now on a bounded and closed thing, when I'm dealing with this piece of metal or a finite space with a sharp edge to it, I've got to have an absolute high and absolute low, but I've only got one critical point. What does that mean? Something's going to exist on the boundary. The absolute high or the absolute low must be on the boundary, unless this critical point is both the absolute high and the absolute low, in which case I'd be talking about a level plane, which I don't have. Okay, so let's do the second derivative test and at least find out what's happening at 3, 1. But it seems like the real work is going to be examining the boundary. But before we go to a break, let's at least see what's happening at 3, 1. So I have to do two derivatives with respect to x. So fx and then differentiate with respect to x again. By the simple nature of the surface, that turns out to be zero. F, Y, Y, second derivative. First derivative, F with respect to Y is second derivative. Differentiate this with respect to Y, that's also zero. But F, X, Y, take the derivative of the x derivative with respect to y and I get one. Notice also if I take the first order partial with respect to y and then with respect to x, I also get one. These are the same. In this case, a nice continuous second order and first order partials. So what's my discriminant? And by the way, notice that these are constant. They don't even depend on where you are. Again, this is a very simple surface. The simplicity of the surface is because, excuse me, this is at most order two. So two derivatives was gonna turn it into a constant. So this discriminant, don't get fooled by that. Sometimes you have to actually plug in the point, but this discriminant is zero times zero minus one squared. And I could say that everywhere. Now I'm only interested in the flat place. There's definitely a flat place at three and one. There's not flat places anywhere else. So this is also at three comma one, which is the only place that I'm ever caring about. What is the discriminant? Is negative. So what do I have at three one? I must have a saddle point. Now, I'm interested in the saddle point, and I'm interested in what it looks like. And by the way, since I'm here, I might as well find the value. So the original function at 3, 1. What's the value of the original function at 3 and 1? B3 minus 3 minus 3. This would be negative 3. And now you see that this drawing is not going to be good at all because I drew this thing entirely positive. So we're going to have to come up with a better drawing in a moment. And I'll show you how to do that nicely in Mathematica. So what do I got? My only hope for a mountaintop or a valley bottom inside the region, inside the region was at 3, 1. And that turned out to be a saddle point but I want you to use this analogy of the sharp piece of metal. So that means that somewhere on this boundary, I have an absolute high and an absolute low. And like any sharp shard of metal or glass, I don't see glass bent into a curvy shape. Although you could talk about the shard of a glass bottle broken. I have to be careful with the boundary because it could be very sharp. I have to look on the boundary, 
for absolute min or max, but I also have to be careful with the corners because they can be extremely sharp. I'm not looking for sharpness, I'm looking for highs or lows, but I'm just using that analogy of being careful with the edges or the points, the corners of a shard of metal or glass. So I need to examine these boundaries and these corners independently. So it's off to the boundary. And remember the boundary includes corners. But I'll show you how to deal with this efficiently as soon as we come back from the break. So let's call this at uh, well, generously at 8.59, let's come back at 9.04. Nine oh four p.m. and then we'll finish doing this, and we'll give ourselves a nice image of it. I'm going to take a break and stretch my legs for a second. I invite you to do the same, and I'm going to mute my microphone while I'm doing that. And I'll see you in a few minutes.
Okay, and we're back. And a little whiteboard experiment didn't do too badly the other day, but I'm gonna stay to my paper right here. So let's examine the boundaries of this region R. Sometimes you see people write that the curly partial symbol, partial R to mean boundary of R, but I don't think that's so critical here. Let's just say the boundary of R is a curve in three pieces. Let's call that curve C. And let's say this curve C is made up of C1, C2, and C3. Ah, so there's a value to curves in the plane or curves in space. How did we parameterize these? So let's parameterize these three curves. Now, if you're not comfortable that you haven't parameterized a lot of curves, this might take you a second to recognize, but these are just straight lines. So I can parameterize C1, C2, and C3 strictly with base point direction vector. So that's what I'm gonna do right here. Say so R1 of T is going from zero, zero to three, zero. And I can do that with a base point of zero and zero. And with a direction vector, I'm gonna gain no altitude, no y, so I'll say three t and zero t. Now, really, it'd be much simpler if I just wrote that three t comma zero from t from zero to one. I like zero to one, this is a nice compact interval. This takes me from zero, zero to three, zero, as t ranges from zero to one. So likewise, you can parameterize both of these. Let's say R2. Now, let's do this on some non-trivial case right here. I want to go from three, zero, and I want to land at zero, four. So if I'm starting at three, zero, this is one way you could write this down. I want to go backwards five units on the x-axis. You could say minus five t, and I want to go upwards four units on the y-axis, plus 14. So this gives me a direction vector of minus five, four. Now, I don't have to write the plus zero. I could just said minus five t plus three and four t. But again, the nice thing about this is I naturally defined it on zero to one. So if I, coming down here, it's not a hard thing to do. I'm gonna start at zero and four and I wanna come down. I could go up or down, but I like this idea of just driving along the boundary and we're gonna use that as an analogy later. So I'm gonna start at the point zero and four. And I'm not gonna move anywhere on the x-axis, zero t plus zero. On the y-axis, I'm gonna drop four units, minus four t. And t is gonna range from, again, zero to one. So this is zero and minus four t plus four. The second one was minus five t plus three and four t. That was the more involved one. The first and last ones are pretty simple. So now what I'm gonna do is plug those into f. What's f of r1? That means there's an x and y in r1, r2 and r3. I'll plug those in there. So I'm gonna say, what's f of three t and zero? And when I do that, and remember where f was, I'm gonna get back our f over here. I'll bring it back in for a moment. Then if y was zero, that puts a zero here and here. And I just have three t times zero minus three times zero, but here I have a minus three t. On the interval zero to t to one. Now I can visualize what that looks like on the interval from zero to one minus three T. 
that would just be a line going sharply down like that. Does it have any higher low points? Not in between, because calculus tells me that there's derivative of this is minus three. There's no place where this is zero. So this always has a slope of minus three. There is a high point here and a low point there. And those, remember, now let's be careful, that's when t is zero. But when t is zero, I'm at the point zero, zero on my triangle. When t is one, I'm at the point, what? Three, zero on my triangle. So if I examine f of zero, zero, put zero and zero into there, I get zero. If I examine f of three, zero, I get minus three when I put that into here. So these are potential high and low points. Now be careful, on this edge of the metal shard, that is a low point, but I don't know if it's the absolute low point because I haven't looked at the other two edges. So let's look at edge number two, which is the messier edge. Let's plug in minus five T plus three and 4t into f, and then see what I get. So I'll write this out, minus 5t plus 3, that's the x, 4t, that's the y, minus, minus 5t plus 3, that's the x, minus 3 times 4t, that's the y. So I'm just inserting x and y into this function right here. And then let's clean this up. So what do we got? We got 5t squared. That's right there. Oh, I'm sorry, five and four. We got, oh yeah, no, 5t squared. This is, yeah, I was, my writing is so sloppy. I didn't know this is four minus t or 4t, it's 4t. So what I got is, excuse me, minus 20t squared plus 12t, you're gonna write carefully, plus 5t minus 3, and now here's a minus 12t again. So take the time to do this carefully. Got minus 20t squared. 12t minus 12t is no t's, except for this 5t right here. And then you got to subtract 3 right here. Now this is an actual parabola. It could have, it's opening downwards, so it could have a high and low point. What's the first derivative of this parabola? Is minus 40 t plus five. And that tells me that I'm interested in t equals one eighth. So what I have here, and again, this is a schematic drawing, from zero to one, I have a parabola that's got a potential high point. I know parabola opens downward, this is a high point. I could also do the first or second derivative test on this function, but at one eighth. So let's plug in t equals zero. If I plug in t equals zero to this mess, I get negative three. If I plug in t equals one to this mess, well, I'm gonna get in trouble now because I get negative 23 plus five is negative 18. That is way down there, but my drawing isn't reflecting that. My drawing's going off the paper too. And then at one eighth, I must get a high point. So I must have a parabola that's kind of looking like this. It's just a piece of a parabola with two low points at minus three and minus 18. And this high point here at one eighth, I'm not drawing very well to scale, am I? So what's this high point? minus 20, 1 64th, plus five over eight, minus three. You can see the pain of examining this, right? So what I get is high point, I get minus 10 over 32. I get to cut it again, minus five over 16. And five eighths is plus 10 over 16. And minus three is minus 48 over 16. I'm getting nervous right here because I don't want to see a negative number. 
but apparently I get a negative number. So there's strike three against my drawing. This thing must be entirely below the x-axis. What do I get is five sixteenths. I get minus 43 sixteenths, which is a little bit above minus three, which is negative 48 sixteenths. So let's look at f of one eighth for t. We get minus 43 sixteenths. Now when t is one eighth, what is the x and y right here? One half for y minus five eighths plus 24 eighths is what? 19 eighths, 24 eighths minus five eighths, 19 eighths. For x and y, this is 19 eighths and four eighths, one half. This is a value of minus 43 over 16. But again, at zero, zero, that's where this point is. I got a minus three, I already knew that. This point right here, when t equals one, when t equals one, I'm at minus five plus three. Oh, I'm feeling very nervous right here. So let's go backwards. Let's find out what's going on. That doesn't feel like a good number. It starts at three, zero. I'm nervous about this edge right here. Did I honestly go in there? Starts at five, zero. Thank you. Thank you. So that is an issue right there. I'm gonna have to recheck that boundary. Now it goes from five, zero to zero four. Okay, I'm gonna pay the price for that, but it's worth it. I apologize. So let's write this really carefully now. That'll make some of the calculation easier. I am sorry, I did not pay attention to that earlier. You gotta parameterize things very carefully, 4t, t, from zero to one, f of minus five t plus five and four t is minus five t plus five, four t, this is x times y, minus x, five t plus five, minus three y, 40. Let's take our time and draw a nicer drawing this time. Minus 20t squared plus 20t plus 5t minus 5 minus 12t minus 20t squared. 25 minus 12 is plus 13t minus five. Okay, this is just looking at the parameter t from zero to one. This will give me a flat point. If I look at minus 40 t plus 13, wow, I'm gonna enjoy this even less. This is equal to zero at t equals 13 over 40. We're gonna have to do some confirmation on this with our machine. And that gives me what values for X and Y. Four times that is 13 over 10. And five times that negative 65 over 40 plus 200 over 40 is 135 over 40. Now you can check if that lines lands on that point. You could also reduce this by fives. You could say 20 and seven over eight and 13 over 10. But that's an awkward point to insert into this function. I just prefer to put the 13 over 40 in here, but even that's awkward. So let's try it 
I don't know which one we're going to prefer to put this into xy minus x minus 3y, or to put this into this function right here. I'm going to do it into this function right here and see how this comes out. Minus 20. Do this in a particular fashion so I can watch the canceling. 13 over 40, 13 over 40, minus 13. 13 over 40, that's a plus sign. Minus 5. And I get to cancel on the 20s here, make a 2. So I get 169 over 80, negative. Here I get 169 over 40. Double that is what? 338 over 80 plus. But notice the subtraction is still 169 over 80. And here's 400 over 80. We will verify this on the machine. But I'm looking like 169 over 80 minus 400 over 80. And that is what? 231, negative 231 over 80. Now looking at this just as a function of t, right? Put in t equals zero and I get minus five. Put in t equals one and I get negative 25 plus 13 is negative 12. I'm down here at the low point of negative 12, but here this is about almost 240. That's like negative three-ish. So that must be the high point of the parabola at 13 over 40. And remember, this is just one edge of this piece of metal. So I have low point at 0, 0, which is at minus 5. Now, what do we got right here? That makes me upset that this should have been a 5 right here, right? Because I had to go out to 5. I looked at that 3, and that's why I wrote those 3s in there. So. That's okay. If I put 5t in there, we can quickly correct this. So minus 5t, zeros otherwise, minus 5 at 5, 0. So I should be more careful. This, this is a pain of examining the boundary f of, what's this point when t equals one? Where are we at? Zero and four. This is another corner. And now it's minus 12. That's looking pretty down. It's looking pretty far down. And then I have a relative high point at 27 eighths and 13 tenths. It's a relative high point of minus 231 over 80. Okay, that was the painful boundary. Now let's look at this last boundary, which was, make sure I did that one right, minus 4t plus 4 takes me from 4, 0, 4 to 0, 0. That's looking better. And when I plug in that curve, I get x times y. I'll just write this out. 4t plus 4 minus x minus 3 times y minus 4t plus 4. Paper is a little bit littered here, which just gives me uh, 12t minus 12. Now this is also a line from 0 to 1. 
and at t equals zero, it's at minus 12. And at t equals one, you're at zero. So there's no flat places on this edge of the shrapnel. This is t equals zero, which corresponds to f of zero and four being minus 12. Excuse me, I have to move the paper up. And this is t equals one, which corresponds to f of zero and zero, which is f of zero and zero. Go back oh, to the original function. I should be doing f of zero and zero is zero in the original function. Why did I say f of zero and zero is minus five in this function? That doesn't look good. So I'm gonna have to go back and recheck that. This point was t equals zero, which corresponded to five and zero. So that's five and zero. This is zero and four. This is that. Okay, so now, we have a feeling for what's happening on this piece of shrapnel. And I'll make a crude drawing and then we'll make a good drawing of Mathematica. At five and zero, I have a low of minus five. At zero and zero, I have a value of zero and that edge is a straight line. Does that make sense? Because I have y equals zero on that whole thing. I just have minus x that line. And then at zero and four, I had a value of minus 12. And on that y-axis, I have a straight line down to that minus, where's my zero and four? I have a straight line down to that minus 12. This is minus five, this is minus 12. But on this edge of the surface, I had a parabola cut. And I had a relatively high point right there at 27 eighths and 13 tenths. And that high value was minus 231 over 80. So what do I got from my absolute highest and lowest? It looks like the absolute highest is at zero, zero. When I touch height zero, it looks like my absolute lowest is at zero, four, when I touch minus 12. And this is just a triangular shard of metal. There was way too much mess in creating that. So I think we need some visual demonstration. And I'm gonna pop over to, excuse me. I'm gonna take this over to Mathematica. Let me launch Mathematica and see if we can do this a little more graphically. You can also test the derivatives and test the edges inside Mathematica, and you can write that as a sample if you like. But first, I'm interested in what it looks like. So I'm going to open this. I think I'm even going to share my whole window because I might pull into the documentation for you. So let me share whole screen. And that means I'm going to have to make this a little bit wider. 
and pump up the words. Okay, let's see how this types. Let's say I'm gonna put in my function f, x underscore comma y underscore. And it's gonna be defined to be x times y minus x minus three y. Do not write, again, do not write xy, because then Mathematica thinks that's a different variable. You either write xy with a space in between, then Mathematica understands multiplication, or you can insert an asterisk to safely do that. Now, I could just plot this function as is. But this will give me a bad view of it because I'll be looking at more than I need to. I won't be looking at my edges, but just the function as it is, let's take a look. And uh, minus five to five, minus five to five, since that matches part of what we're doing. Uh, in fact, even zero to five would be sufficient in the x direction. And zero to four would be sufficient in the y direction. Uh, what am I doing? I'm plotting and I should be plotting 3D, of course. It's good to be reminded of those errors from time to time. There's my surface. And in fact, if I did a color function on this, I could even see highs and lows. So I wanna look up in the documentation color function. And I want to use this color function with just a Z hue. Let me pump that up so you can see it right there. So let's grab this color function Z hue. Let's bring it over here. And what I have is highs and lows on this square or rectangular sheet of metal. But how can I restrict this to the triangular sheet? So I can see highs and lows here. In fact, at 3, 1, which is about right here, I could detect the saddleness of it, how it bends down in this direction, bends up in this direction. So at 3, 1, I do have a saddle point there. Maybe we'll have to add that point as we go along. But I'll keep the color function here. What I want to do is plot it over a region. So there's something called a region function. You know, Mathematica tells me to use region function, but I'm going to have to look up what region function is. And I'm going to blow up those words. There's an option for plotting functions to specify a region over the plot drawn. OK, this looks promising. This is what I want to do. I want to draw a surface, but just over a section. Now here it's an annular section. And there's a little too fancy for me, but I think what I want to do is let's cut and paste this right here. This is not going to be what I want, but I'll just show you how it works. There, I drew this surface over an annulus. Now you can see the sharp edges to it. But I want to draw this surface. Let's go back to the paper over the triangle. So I need to examine this triangle more carefully. And I'm going to go back to my paper for a second to do that. Stop sharing this. Go back to the paper. So let's look at this triangle in a large scale, five and four. What is this line right here? x equals zero, that's this vertical line. This is y equals zero. This line right here, slope intercept form, the slope is minus four over five, and the intercept is four, minus four over five x plus four. Let's make sure I'm doing that right. At zero, I get four, and at five, I get zero. Good, or if I wrote this in standard form, four-fifths x plus y 
equals four, or I did this four X plus five Y equals 20. What I want is to shade this region right here. So I'm gonna turn these lines into shadings of the plane. Let's shade where X is greater than or equal to zero. That's gonna go that way. Let's shade where Y is greater than or equal to zero. That's gonna go that way. And now let's shade below this line. Be careful how you select below this line, but it's gonna be four X plus five Y is less than or equal to 20. I can go below just by saying less than or equal to because this positive coefficient right here. This is my region. And that region I can type into Mathematica to just have the surface drawn over this triangle. Very convenient. So I'm gonna go back to sharing screen at my Mathematica page. And now I'm going to draw my region function like this. X is greater than or equal to zero. Y is greater than or equal to zero. This is not correct, so be careful. And I'll show you how to correct it. 4X plus 5Y is greater than or, oh, sorry, less than or equal to zero. Now, Mathematica is right now telling me right away something's wrong right here. So the problem is what I want is not to have these conditions in this way, but I want to say I want all three conditions to be satisfied. So I add logical operator and. Add logical operator and. Now I'm going to be graphing over the region where x is greater than or equal to zero and y is greater than or equal to zero and 4x plus 5y is less than or equal to 20, excuse me. Let's give it a snap. There's my triangular piece of metal. That's beautiful. And there is this edge where I have a high point on this parabolic edge right here, but it's not the high point of the whole structure. Do you see the high point here is colored red? It's at zero. And the low point is down here at minus 12. Now I can improve this box because this box is four by four by minus 12. So let me improve this by doing a little box ratio here to make this stand out a little bit better. Excuse me, box ratios. And let's run this uh, well, you can start one to one to one just to see what it would look like. That's not a bad view of what's happening at all. It does uh, distort minus 12 to 12 to be the same size as zero to four and zero to five, but it's not a bad way to look at this at all. Let me put in the point at three comma one, and let me put in the point that's the high point on this edge. So let's put in points for high point, very low point, and saddle point. What I'm going to do for that is suppress output on plot 3D. I'm going to say, let's give this a name like uh, surface, assign it to the plot 3D, and that suppresses the output. Let's give a name like uh, extreme points. I don't know if that's a good name or not, but let's call it as list point plot 3D, which is add a list of points. And the list of points is going to be the key points. One of the points is 0, comma 0, Sorry, zero comma zero comma, remember F of zero comma zero, that'll be the height. So that'll be the very high point. I need some more braces in here. The next point would be at 
three comma one comma f of square bracket three comma one. Need another brace in there. And the next point would be at, let's cut and paste so I don't have to type so much. F of what it was, zero and four, got me down to minus 12. Now I can also check values here in a second. And what are we talking about right here? So this is my points. If I just plot them as this, I don't think I'm gonna have any good images. I just have three points right here, right? But I could suppress output and I could add that to my picture and see how it comes up. So let's say show, uh, what should we show? Oh, and I, I'm gonna go back to sharing my whole screen, excuse me. Uh, let's get over here to my whole screen because I may, I am nervous that I didn't show you that region function in the, looking up region function in the documentation. So let's show surface and extreme points. It's not too bad. Uh, what I got right here is these balls at saddle point and the two corners, I can make them stand out possibly. If I said point style, and it doesn't like point style. So point style is not an option for list plot, list point plot 3D. Well, we better go find out what's an option then. So list, this is why you use the documentation, point plot 3D. So what are my options? Plot style, okay. Oh, it suddenly likes that. Let's make these uh, points stand out. What's gonna stand out, black or red? Let's make them red. And let's see if I got a size of points I can imagine. Plot style, plot theme, plot region, labeling size, filling size. I want something style of points. I don't want automatic. Let me see if I can, I do see things in here. Oh, do I see things about size of points? I know I've seen size of points before. I'm seeing lots of cute things, but not size of points. Plot style, pink, green. Okay, point size could be tiny or medium, but that means I could identify a point size. Let's try point size 0 0.5. I have a feeling that's gonna be a failure. Yeah, <laughs> these are giant points. Okay, I'll make them 0 0.05. Okay, that's a little more cute. Uh, let's do some transparency on my surface. I'm about to turn off my silly lights in here. So let's say plot style could be here. Blue, I'll take away the coloring and opacity of I'm going to make sure my lights don't turn off, 0 0.3. Maybe I'll just go for opacity and take away the blue. But I'm just curious what this looks like. OK, what do we got right here? I'll make this box smaller. So now I have my saddle point with a little red ping pong ball on it. And I have my corners high and low with a little red ping pong ball on it. Maybe it'd be cool to draw some contours on the surface, but I have identified what? The saddle point, the max and the min. Let's add a point here at this false high point, which was what? 
Oh, I gotta see if I tracked that down correctly. It wasn't one eighth. It was the 13 fortieths. It was a 27 eighths and 13 tenths. The reason I'm doing that is to see if I calculated that number correctly. So let's try 27 eighths and 13 tenths and F of that. You see, I'm not gonna worry about what the function's value is there. I'm just gonna let Mathematica worry about the function's value. Got it, got it. And let's cut and paste these crazy numbers into there. See if that ball shows up at the place I expect it to show up. Yes, that ball is showing up. Oh, that ball is not showing up at the place I expect it to show up. That ball is not showing up at that surface. So how am I gonna deal with that? Let's use some Mathematica to figure that out. Where should that ball have been? Now, if I go back to my paper, I assume that that was minus five T plus five and four T. So when I did that work, I got T equals minus 13 over 40. So let's plug this into the function. Let's say F of minus five T plus five comma four T. Let's see what we get right there. Okay, and then let's take the derivative of that with respect to T. Okay, and let's set that equal to zero. Let's do a little more mathematical magic. So solve, copy, where the derivative equals zero. I mean, I could check if this is what I expected it to be in the first place, but let's just go ahead with the solving and see what happens. Solve for T, 13 over 40. Okay, so I'm good on that. But then the question is, what happens if I put in 13 over 40 to that function? So let's come back, grab the function. I'm doing a little demonstration of calculus here. There's the function, but I wanna insert 13 over 40. So I do that by saying, slash period t is replaced by 13 over 40. Minus 231 over 80 at 13 over 40. So what's minus 5t at 13 over 40? Let's see if I got this point right. Oh, doesn't like that. Why doesn't it like that? It doesn't like my syntax right there. Let's see if it preferred square brackets. No, it doesn't like that at all. Let's just plug 13 over 40 into there and get rid of that fancy step and let's get rid of these brackets there 27 over 8 that was correct and 4 times that is 13 over 10 wow that's really going to bother me then so 27 8 and oh 13 over 10 there we go and sorry for the screw up right there this was 13 over 10 now let's see if that places the red dot correctly. So we did do that calculation correct. There's the high point on that edge. I did do the calculation correct, but I entered it incorrectly. So here's a demonstration, by the way, of plugging the curve into the function, then differentiating, then solving to see where the derivative is zero. And then you have your point right here. By the way, you could have done this also with the X and Y. So let me just look for the critical points. There's the derivative with respect to X, copy. There's the derivative with respect to Y, copy. Now, what if I wanted to solve this system to see where it was? 
both equal to zero. Well, I could just put in a system of equations, x comma y, solve an x comma y for where the derivative of x is zero and the derivative with respect to y, change that, is zero. And then it would have said three and one. So you can dig into Mathematica and have Mathematica do a lot of that number crunching for you, but I wanted to do it by hand. Whereas doing it by hand was not very impressive because I kept making calculational errors. So let me get back to this. This is page five. I'm gonna go back to my paper in a second. So what did you learn right here? Don't be in a hurry. Now, what you really learned is analyzing the boundary is a serious pain. Analyzing the boundary is a serious mess. And you wish there was a better way to analyze the boundary. And that's what Lagrange multipliers is going to do for us, but we don't have a lot of time to explore them right now. So what I'm going to do is shrink this down. And uh, I did this once before. Let me save this and throw this into the chat in case people could use it. Of course, people in the plural are not here right now, but maybe you like this worksheet. I could post this on the website too. So let me save this worksheet. I'll throw it in the chat. I'll post it on the website. And you can use it as a starter or a helper to do your problem. Uh, this stuff down here is random garbage, but uh, give you an idea of what I was doing. Let me save it. What should we call this? Where's my little save box? My little save box comes up. Let's call it 261 dash exercise dash o four dash o seven dash what was this three four four and let's call it uh you know mathematica it's a mathematica notebook already okay that's good let's save this on the desktop four and i didn't write in any any explanations in here but if you're watching the video later, you also pick up what we did here. I'm going to throw this into the chat, but I'm also going to later post this onto our website. So let me first figure out or remember how to throw something in the chat. Got it. On my side, it says sent successfully. Do you have it on your side? Just. Give me a thumbs up or something. Okay, very good. So uh, I want this to help you, but and but let me let me say something very carefully. Okay, this was a simple problem. It came up with a simple image, and Mathematica can do a lot of heavy lifting for you. But I really want you to focus on the ideas. You're working out this answer, and then you're verifying it afterwards on the machine. You can explore things on the machine all you want, but you also want to have the ability to work out these answers directly yourself. So I'm providing this notebook to you as a service, but not as a demonstration of how you should do this problem yourself. You have to analyze boundaries on your own. As it happens on the homework problem that I gave you, I also had a triangular boundary. But the triangular boundary is a little messier than this one. So you have to do a little more careful work analyzing the boundary. I had a simple boundary along the X and Y axis with one other line. And I was careless in how I approached it. So it's kind of like a warning. But you can draw your homework problem very nicely 
in Mathematica and check your high and low points, whatever other points you have. Okay, I could say a word about Lagrange multipliers, but it's just not gonna happen right now. So I'm gonna save that till later. And I'm gonna quit sharing Mathematica window, go back to my screen, I'll just say next time. Because here's what's in your mind. Wow, what a royal pain examining boundaries is. Now, as it happens, the method of Lagrange multipliers gives you a different way to examine boundaries and constraints. Because a boundary is just like a constraint on the function. Lagrange multipliers gives you a slick way to do this, but it also comes with its own price or pain. So first you learn how to examine the boundaries in the traditional one step at a time way. Next time I'll show you Lagrange multipliers which can be used to examine boundaries in a different way, somewhat faster, but it also has its own price. Okay, let's let it go right there. And I will stop the recording and I will get the recording uploaded, papers uploaded. I'll get that Mathematica notebook uploaded for everyone and then let you guys go jump at it.